paradigm does not claim to have all the answers. We simply desire to be better each day. We make videos in the hope that other people that desire the same can use some of the tools we've discovered along our journey. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Paradigm Podcast. It's been a while, right? I mean, we haven't uploaded in a while. Um, you know, some things came up, but we decided to do a whole book in one episode. So what we would like is by, by the end of the episode, let us know what you think about this. You know, do you prefer this over the chapter method? Um, we're really trying something new out, and we really enjoy doing it this way. So um, <clears throat> we may do this moving into the future. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. We are so excited that you're here and grateful that you're here. Um, so we hope you're having a great week and are grateful that you tuned in. Uh, before we get started, we want to remind you, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribing, liking, sharing the video, all of those are a great way of supporting the channel. Um, we're also on all other associated podcast platforms. So go ahead and drop a five-star review. Go check us out on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts. Amazon podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, we're on that thing. So go ahead and check us out on there. Um, and we also love interacting with you. So uh, follow us on all our social media platforms. All the information you will need is down in the description box below. So the information used for this discussion comes from the book Discrimination and Disparities by Thomas Sowell. Really interesting read. Go pick it up. Thank you for writing it, Thomas go Sowell. That book. Yeah. Go ahead and buy the book. Go all right. Book. Um, so a little bit about who Thomas Sowell is. So Thomas Sowell was born June 30th, 1930. He is an American economist, syndicated columnist, writer, and social theorist who currently serves as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution of uh, Stanford University. After graduating magna cum laude in 1958, he completed his master's degree from Columbia University the next year. In 1968, he earned his Doctor of Philosophy degree in economics from University of Chicago. He is often described as a black conservative for his assessments of economic theories, encouraging hard work and self-sufficiency. Prior to settling in to his current position, he taught at several institutions, including Howard University, Rutgers, Cornell, and many more. He also did military service for two years during the Korean War and was an employee of the US Department of Labor. As a columnist, he has penned articles for many prestigious newspapers, magazines, and online publications. He has authored over 30 books so far in his writing career, including Race and Economics, A Conflict of Visions, The Vision of the Anointed, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, and Intellectuals in Race. Despite being criticized for his controversial ideas, he is considered one of the greatest African-American thinkers of his generation. So before we jump into the discussion, um, we wanted to clarify why this book was chosen. So Devin, it was your turn to choose a book uh, yes, this sir. time around. So we're interested. Why did you choose this book? Um, <clears throat> I feel like we're kind of like going over it so many times. Um, but I think it's really, um, I think listening back to our podcast, since like I edit our videos and I like watch back probably the most, um, like just repeat on, on, on repetitive, like a repetitive nature. Um, we tend to like us as a group, no, no, no one else. Uh, we tend to generalize a lot of stuff, a lot of information that we like believe to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like the, the, the information I've heard about this book is um, he's really trying to like kill people's small per perspectives and give people an idea of what the real world looks like mm -hmm. um, in, in data, in factual uh, empirical evidence. Obviously, it's, it's hard to dissect everything. Like if you if you get this book and read it, you'll know exactly wh what we're talking about when we're when we discuss things. But it is a, it's a fairly difficult book to kind of digest everything. Um, it's got and, multiple and reads. Exactly. <clears throat> and ex and, and, and ex if you're definitely trying to like uh, regurgitate it to anybody, it's it's definitely like a reread. You definitely have to double yeah, for sure. Double read. Um but I think, um, was there something you wanted to learn from this book? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, for individuals, he wants to get people to be individuals, to think for yourself, to think critically and not just accept a message and not just accept things for truth. Um, and to really think for yourself, um, this book has shown me like a side of me that like, um, it's kind of proven that like generalizations are, it's, it's almost like 
born in us. It's like stamped in us in a way. Um, and you should want to search for like being able to critically think on topics, ideas, issues. Mm -hmm. Um, if you question things, you shouldn't be shamed for wanting to question ideas. Um, and I think Mm. in our society, especially where we live in California, (laughs) if you start to question anything, ideology, uh, science, I don't, I'm not going to go too far, but like, it's just, if you start to raise awareness around why things are white way, the way they are, it's almost like you get ousted in a way. And I think Thomas Sowell, he wants people to like think for themselves. And Mm. I think that, that, Mm. That's who he's to talking it. to and for this book. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's what I look to learn too, is just how, how can I critically think better? Okay. So mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, on that idea of getting ousted for um, questioning the, the narrative. Yeah. The right? norm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this book um, may be seen as controversial by some um, and, you know, to the viewers watching that we read books to learn, um, not to reinforce beliefs that we already have. <laughs> So it is important to ponder ideas that we may not necessarily agree with in order to expand how we think. We believe we can all agree on that. With that in mind, we can move forward into discussing this book um, and keep that mindset and paradigm for this discussion. And we don't know. We're um, we're just throwing stuff up. Like we each get a turn and we got to pick a book. And sometimes we we, we take on more than we choose. Sometimes we might pick a dud. Like we don't we don't know. But. We're jumping into the chaos of like, what's something we don't know? You know, what's something new? Thomas Sowell, never heard of him. Now I know about him, you know? And yeah. I see him all yeah. over that's the Twitter fuck- now, you know? It's like weird how... <laughs> yeah. How yeah. Yeah. They're targeting you. Yeah. Uh, hey, it's found its way. <laughs> it's yeah. your algorithm. Huh. Uh, so let's jump in by discussing the main topics of the book. So one really important topic, and I believe this comes from chapter one, uh, Thomas Sowell talks about the different types of discrimination Um, he lists discrimination 1A, discrimination 1B, and discrimination 2. So he classifies three different types of discrimination that all human beings experience in one way or another. Yeah. So, uh, David, do you want to go over discrimination 1A and B? Uh, Well, before we get into that, I want to ask, why do you guys think it was important that he starts out the book with describing different types of discrimination before we even get into, like, the the uh, meat and potatoes of the book? Okay. Do you guys have an answer for that? No. Yeah. I mean, if, if we're going to talk about a book, if we're going to write a book about discrimination and disparities, we first have to classify what those are and define what those are so that we can have um, a a discussion or like a debate on common ground. Like we are on the same foundation. We can have a discussion now that we classify and agree that these are the different types of discrimination because it really does cover all of them. I don't think that I can classify a 2B. You know what I mean? Is, he really does nail all of them down. Yeah, yeah. He definitely, he definitely nails like the title of the book like, before you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I agree with Jay's definition. Yeah, interesting. So there's three different types of discrimination explained in this book. Um, discrimination one A, which is individual discrimination based on uh, race, gender, or other things, and you can gather evidence about the individual person. Uh, We have discrimination 1B, which is a group-based discrimination, and uh, that discrimination would occur based on group data, so collecting, uh, you know, group data. And And wait, uh, wait, before you jump into two, um, so just to clarify a little bit, with 1A, all discrimination 1A and 1B requires empirical data. Okay, true. Right, so that's important to mention is when we're discriminating using 1A or 1B, and the fact is that all human beings do discriminate. Yeah. Um, do we? It, it, that is facts, right? What You have a favorite type of ice cream. You have a favorite football team. Yeah, you have a favorite yeah. makeup. You have a favorite whatever it is. That's a form of discrimination. Coke versus Pepsi. Coke versus Pepsi, right? So um, when we talk about discrimination, one, in any of them, A or B, it's important to note that there's empirical data about that. So if we're talking about discrimination, one, A, um, if I'm a company and I want to hire the best individual for the position, I need to verify that that person and collect data on that person to show that they're the person for the job, that right. they're the right person for the position. If I have somebody that's going to be doing driving for my company, they need, I'm going to do a drug test, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. I want to make sure you're not um, using drugs that will affect your driving. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that you um, aren't an alcoholic, right? So I'm going to check your background to make sure you don't have any DUIs, to make sure you don't have to go to any... Um, like court mandated. What are you a square dude? Fucking let's let's drink, dude. 
any of those things. So it's <laughs> judging the individual if you're a company is a little bit more costly than judging as a group, right? Um, so 1B, you gather data about groups of people. Um, so I think one of the ideas he mentions is... Um, I'm trying to... Are you thinking of the examples that he uses? Or yeah, because one of the ideas... That was, he used an example of companies using background checks is a way to get rid of the other type of discrimination because you, you pay the money to do all the background checks to, that way you don't want to discriminate on people on the broad sense. Right. This is one B that's one a that he just described. Okay. So with, with one B say I have uh, national data, right. On group X or group Y. Mm -hmm. And again, let's say I have a, a, uh, a company that does driving is involved in everyday work. If group X has 50% of them are alcoholics and group Y 10% are yeah. alcoholics, but I don't have enough money to evaluate these people as individuals, I'm going to go with census data or like a national uh, collected data where I can be like, okay, if I'm going to put my money on something, I'm going to put my money on the 10% and be willing to like take that risk over the 50%. Yeah, because it's so a lot larger. This is all empirical data gathered about group mm -hmm. groups as a whole. Yeah, and it, it it falls down to the people that are not alcoholics taking the crap end or the shit end of the state right. because it's like because of the group because of the group yeah exactly right so, yeah. because of the the statistics of the group yeah and okay. that's based in data that's discrimination one yeah. a any of the discrimination ones one always line, empirical one B, data yeah one B. yeah okay so uh, if you want to continue with discrimination two yeah so discrimination two um, this is a biased form of discrimination that um really needs no empirical data. It's just pure bias. And um, I asked Jay earlier, um, which one do you think is like the most harmful? And I think we kind of like settled on that discrimination too can yeah, cause the yeah, most right. damage within um Do you have some examples society. of discrimination too? Some biases um, that we see in culture maybe? Segregation? Segregation, Jim Crow era. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's um, racism. pure bias. Racism. Yeah. Sexism. Sexism. Right. Any... Any of the ones, the big words that you hear thrown around by the SJWs, that all the isms are <laughs> most likely fall under the I, discrimination. I think yeah. this is what people most mostly um, yeah yep. uh, think of when they think of the, the word discrimination. Right? It's a yeah. it's a it's a word that we all assume. I, like when I hear discrimination, I think KKK. You know, yeah, yeah. that's that's what I think. I think of um, segregated you schools. Know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Segre segregation in that aspect. Yeah. Um, I think our mind tends to go there. Yeah. So he um, he laid out all these different types of discrimination uh, in chapter one. Um, and then he also talks about why there are disparities. Right. Um, and one of the ideas he brings up is the idea of prerequisites of success. John, do you have any ideas um, or like remember anything that he mentions about prerequisites for success? There's things like environment, you know. Uh, yeah. I think he brings up the example of of the Jewish race as like a whole or as like a people or whatever. And that for like a long <laughs> time, they had like, let's say three out of the four prerequisites to be successful. Like they had family, they had tradition, they had education, but they had like, they were missing something. And then uh, like late into like the 19th century, like one of the prerequisites was filled and then they became like, they've won more Nobel Peace Prizes than anybody else as like a people have as a whole, mm -hmm. because like, one thing is that they were led into like mainstream academia and stuff. And that was like the last prerequisite. Yeah. Needed. Yeah. 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 So it's prerequisites of success is an important idea. Um, Cause when we talk about discrimination or disparities that we see um, across society, we have to understand that having the prerequisites of success in whatever endeavor you choose to do, um, you have to have all, let's say there's five, you have to meet five out of five. Um, he says in this book, even if you meet four out of five, you're destined for ultimately failure because you have to check off all the boxes in order to be successful in your endeavor. Isn't that interesting? That's a Yeah. I mean, and, and it doesn't have to be something that's like so grand as like the, let's say Jewish, the Jewish background, that right. whole thing that it could even just be for you as an individual um, with whatever you're doing. There is terms that you have to fill and succeed in um, in order to be successful at the endeavor. Yeah. So like for me with school, um, in order to get to grad school, I had to get 120 units 
uh, undergrad undergrad course units mm-hmm. and then get a bachelor's degree to get into a grad program, right? So that's there's multiple boxes that need to be checked in order to get into grad school, and all of those had to be all those prerequisites had to be satisfied before you could be successful in in your goal. Yeah. So it's important to keep in mind the prereqs that come in with success, like the idea of uh, illiteracy. Yeah, if you can't right. read, you know what I mean? How, how successful are you going to be at being, um, you know, a teacher? Yeah, what? All, all success isn't <clears throat> the same either. That's what I was going to gonna say. What success are you guys kind of like thinking about on, on, in terms of this conversation? It just doesn't matter. Okay. Let's put, let's, let's make it is. simple. Like you want to be a skateboarder. You want to land a kickflip. Like what are the prerequisites to land a kickflip? Okay. Well, first you need a board. Second, you need to, you need to learn yep. how to ollie. You know, third, you need a pair of shoes. Like, you have those things. You need two legs. You know, yeah, like, yep. like well, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it could be simple like that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you got to do the right flick. Yeah, you need the skateboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you need the skateboard. And I think the, pre- the prerequisites only go into consider the factor, or the things you need to accomplish the success. It doesn't determine how long it's going to take you, how short, how fast you're going to be able to accomplish it. It doesn't discuss any of that. It's just you need these things and you can get to that success. How long right. it takes, how short it takes, that's really dependent on you. Each um, individual situation. Yeah. Each, yeah, each person's success is going to look different. Everybody has a different yeah. start out point with some sort of prerequisite for success or not have success. And therefore, mm-hmm. the outcomes are going to be well, disparate, will be a word. Or there's going to be disparities yeah, gonna, that's disparate, right, yeah. on all sorts of levels. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why he focuses on equality. Like, if let's say being able to kickflip, if everybody learned kickflip at the same moment in time, that means everybody's equal. But true. if that was true, then we would live in like a fairy tale land, which that's not true because right. I, I remember skateboarding. I remember growing up at skateboarding. Like there was friends that learned tricks way faster than <clears throat> that way, like learned kickflip way faster than I could. And it right. took me longer to learn, like, let's say, tray flip, and they were learning it faster. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, if everybody could learn at the same pace, then yeah, I guess we could live. <laughs> live in that fantasy yeah. world but i used don't. to think like that i used to be like man if i lived in like la or like the bay area with like all these like nice skate spots and stairs and stuff i could probably get so much like better, better practice yeah. in and the sc- the spots <coughs> in fresno were like not that great but yeah i see what you're saying that makes yeah. sense i like the skateboarding example <laughs> yeah i think a lot of people are gonna identify with that too yeah but the opportunity <clears throat> would be like everybody gets a skateboard yeah you all we're all we're there, equal right? opera so we're aiming for op equal opportunity regardless if you have um you know two legs three arms whatever you know <laughs> three legs three legs three arms. <laughs> a million um, arms all right um so he he progresses into the idea of uh, the costs of discrimination um and he talks about the different costs of different uh parties involved so one that we mentioned here um is companies slash owners of companies um so one that i remember from the ch- the chapter is um uh, the train companies yeah. back yeah. in the time of uh, Jim Crow ra- laws and segregation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea was that um, you had to have separate cars for separate races, mm-hmm. right? Even if that's say one car of a train is filled two thirds of the way full, um, half and half, half white, half black, you need to get a second car attached to the back of that train to put the blacks at the back. I, w- I right? want to go ahead. Costing the company. I want to go, go just before that. Before the Jim Crow law eras came into place, it was the Reconstruction era. And during the Reconstruction era, there weren't these, like, wonky rules in place. So, like, the trains and the trolleys were, were, like, running as normal. So, like, open seats were come, like, first come, first serve. There was no, like, set rules. Like, it's not like it was always, like, blacks in the back, whites in the front. It wasn't like that. So, like, they were efficient. Yeah. And then post-Reconstruction era, when the North left the South to fucking self-govern again, it's when they implement all these laws and the people that it cost were just normal people running the trains. They're like, Hey, and then now we're picking up where you just started. Yeah. Right. Right. And so <clears throat> they would have to put a second car on the back of that train costing more. Cause you have to pull more weight, meaning you need to more fuel for the car. That means you're uh, making the same amount of money across um, more expenses. Right. So there was cost to, um, owners of companies and companies themselves in that sense, that's the cost of their discrimination mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, and some, you know, big changes became because of that one of the uh, railroad owners 
<clears throat> excuse me, one of the railroad companies um, ended up helping to fight for, to end that law, right? They lobbied yeah. to help end that law. And there's a lot of examples in this book of the free market coming in and changing a lot of these discriminatory laws. Um, if let's the discrimination to in the discrimination to sense, when yeah. I say discriminatory laws, um, they come through and they, they, the free market fixes that. Yeah. Right. Um, because ultimately, and I think he, he mentions it in the book, he says, um, racists oh. value, uh, prefer their race over other races, mm -hmm. but ultimately the race, the racist, that individual racist will value themselves more than they value the race. Yeah. Right. And that's where the yeah. free market steps in is like, if this is hurting my pockets, then, um, it needs to be changed. Right. Yeah. So the individual will always value themselves over the group. And the obvious we have to talk about a cost for discrimination is to the discriminated. Um, so the lack of opportunity, right. uh, the loss of um, opportunity, the turmoil that they're going to the face stuff that's that. going to come with that. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's a huge cost. those are huge costs as well. Um, more than just financial, right? So it could be life, you know, life in general. So uh, we had to, we have to address that when we talk about costs of discrimination, especially when it comes to discrimination too. So, yeah. We don't like discrimination too. Two. Yeah. So, um, all right. Then he moves into the idea of sorting. So he, he states that sorting is going to happen, right? Whether it's through self sorting or third party sorting or what he calls oh, yeah. unsorting. Right. Yep. So we all took uh, us history, right. Um, or the people that are in America had to take it. We heard about the idea of assimilation, right? When America was forming, um, and people were first immigrating here, uh, people would assimilate assimilate with people of their own culture, right? So Italians uh, would would assimilate in neighborhoods with Italians, and Jews would assimilate with uh, Jews, and sure. everybody would assimilate with people that were um, of the same culture that they they culture. can identify with and and mm -hmm. live a life around. Um, and so they would self sort, and the idea came around um, a third party sorting where where uh, authoritative entities would unsort the self-sorted communities by um, transplanting somebody not of that culture or not of that sort and into, um, how, do I, how do I put this? Let's say public housing, right? Yeah. Public housing, we've created a building and we're going to, or a, a neighborhood, and we're going to unsort that area by um, placing people of many different cultures into this neighborhood. Um, so we've just unsorted a group of people. And uh, he goes into many different explanations of this. And typically it didn't lead to successful results. Yeah. 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 Do you, would you, would you say that it kind of like hindered the progress of uh, individuals or groups, even having those prerequisites for success? It kind of like was a, could you repeat that again? That, um, like that would be an example of the prerequisites for success that we had just described. Mm -hmm. Maybe those are kind of getting Either. removed at in, in instances of like this case, right? The negative consequences of a third party being entered into the sorting. Yeah. It's, it's a forceful, it's a, it's by force. This person meets what we need for success and we put them into an artificial, right? Right. Sense. Um, but one of the ideas he mentions is low income families getting. So here the idea, the prevailing social vision yeah. um, is that if we took people from low income neighborhoods and placed them in high to middle income neighborhoods, um, they would perform better because they're not in a low income neighborhood. Right. Um, and so that's where this idea of public housing came in. Um, and it happens across all different types of demographics, cultures. Um, and it, it typically didn't lead to successful results. Um, and one idea of public housing that went awry, what was it called? Calibri, Cabrini? Oh, the, the Cabrini Green housing development in Chicago. Yeah. Dude. So I'm, I read a little bit about this, but I'm not probably the most well-versed in this. So if somebody else wants to explain what that is. Is right. that in the book? Yeah. Right. It's mentioned in the book. Um, it's where the, uh, the, the setting is for um, the movie Can Candyman, the, mm -hmm. the horror movie, the the project development there was uh, the same. I think it's the same one, Cabrini Green. 
uh, the prevailing social vision at the time was to make massive structures to take um, the influx. I think it was like an apartment building. Yeah. Well, okay. I think it was war veterans or something at the time. I can't remember exactly, but um, the, it was just, it, it failed. Um, they became like a, a notorious spot for like crime and violence. They had to shut it down and, and remove the, and crush the buildings because it was getting so bad that like the police were getting sniped and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it became something that uh, I guess it was a negative consequence because of the, the prevailing social vision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, here's my mindset on some, on things. If, if a government entity is running something, it's not going to be good. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that's think so? we have I, I, name one good one. We've established that over time since that, like programs that have been implemented in that case, like since we can look back at history, we are able to like identify that now. But as, at one point, like that neighborhood, that was a clean taking care of part of town by veterans or whoever they housed there that was respected as like something the government was doing good for the people. Yeah. But whatever that turning point was to make it turn into something violent and criminal Mm -hmm. activity in that area, I think stuff like that, that like that situation, things that happened in LA with the Rodney King and stuff. And then also welfare, welfare, welfare programs being implemented. All of that stuff has history. So now today speaking about government programs, we look back and be like the government does not help. If anybody from the government says John I'm here, I'm here to uh, I'm here Get to help. The fuck out of here. This then it's like froze. nah, we, we question it. Yeah, um, yeah. He'll, he'll join back in. Um, I, yeah, definitely. Look at the VA. Every veteran I talk to, the VA, the hospital for veterans, yeah. they always like this is a crap show, um, and it's <laughs> so. You know, the idea of self-sorting, um, he, he ultimately makes the argument that self-sorting is better for the individual, um, is better for everybody because you choose to sort yourself how you see fit, right? You have the uh, agency, you have the autonomy to decide where you want to live, um, who you want to associate with, what job you want to work at. Uh, ultimately, you know, everything in your that you can control, you can self-sort, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so his idea is that, Um, self-sorting typically tends, you know, I shouldn't even typically is always better than third party unsorting. Yeah. And I I was doing a little bit of research because I was figuring out like, how could we talk about this on the podcast, giving people like a better understanding. I really wanted to find like a prime example, like Mm -hmm. the situation with the the apartments, but I found this, uh, this, I don't know what it's called. Um, uh, I see you, um, institution, a specific research institution. It's called, well, they have an article on here called welfare programs promote bureaucracy rather than self-sufficiency yeah sort of like what you just were mentioning like people that have to count on a third party to kind of guide them in a way still find themselves falling behind in life Mm -hmm. somehow because they're depending on the third party there's a there's a few paragraphs at the bottom here that i read this uh and it says stated plainly the war on poverty and the nearly 20 trillion dollars spent over uh spent have been a failure to address this we must First, accept the handouts are not a path to prosperity. A person must have both the ability and motivation to provide for themselves and for their families. We must transition away from any form of government intervention that desensitizes, uh, uh, desensitizes yeah. yeah. work and prosperity. The only path to sustained poverty reduction is skill building, as production must come before consumption. Ultimately, a person's st- station in life can only be improved by investing in themselves such that the returns to the uh, the returns to their work can grow as their value to others grows in turn. Mm-hmm. So long as a person lives off of the work of others, his or her station in life will only rise so so far as they will permit. Uh, permit. America was not funded on the premise that your destiny should lay in the hands of others, and we should not fight to ensure that it will not be our future. Mm-hmm. And I think that like. It's pretty Any, like this institution. Yeah, I, it's so on the head. I, okay. I, I literally like was just diving into this institution and they help places like California. They're really trying to figure out like, why are so many people impoverished? And it's almost like their message is trying to get away from government. It, Dude, it's like the I, message is get away from government. I was just watching a bunch of videos. I think it was today actually. Um, like the homeless and like what's happening in San Francisco. San Francisco yeah. Dude, it's, it's, it's scary, man. Like you look around and it's like, Dude. why are we not trying to help? You know, yeah. the situation. Not, I'm not we saying... We gotta help Ukraine, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a little, a little scary. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, I just want to prop an idea out there. What happens when these government funded positions, these jobs to handle these situations? Well, what happens when they actually handle the situation? What happens to their nice job? Like their nice salary? Dude, that's a fucking perfect question. What happens yeah, yeah. when they solve the problem? So like, I mean, Didn't Joe Rogan talk about that? He was like, they don't want to fix a homeless problem because the people that get paid to help the homeless, then lose their yeah, job. They want to help like prolong or propagate it more. I mean, like it's a no brainer, you know, like, and like yeah. these guys are getting interviewed. Like they're making like six figure jobs to like not solve a problem. Yeah. You know, like I wish I could have that job. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that that's another good, great point to like tackle is, or at least to understand if you don't understand this already is look at the problem, who created the problem and who's creating the solution. Okay. It's all of the same entity. I want to solve the problem, but that hurts me as an individual. So I'm not going to, I feel like you can go down the rabbit hole. Like that. Not as an individual. That's the whole hospitals won't cure cancer because it, I think it's that's cost. I mean, that's very down that's the rabbit hole. It, argument. It, I got to have it, some, it, like, could, it could be down the, down the rabbit hole, but think of the homeless problem in San Francisco. I think there is realistic, especially with the capabilities we have today and the printing of money that we've already done. <clears throat> why haven't we already helped help people in our own country that are homeless, that are having drug problems, whatever the case is, mm. how was the problem started? If say it wasn't, say it was individuals, a mass mm. amount of individuals. Okay, cool. We found the problem. What's the solution? Mm, it's a complex problem. I think it's going <clears> to, <throat> like we've learned, it's going to be a really, really complex solution. For yeah. sure. Yeah. For, for sure. I, agree. I was just pointing out, about like the entities that like are in charge of fixing the problem mm -hmm. like well they kind of you know there's a there's a point where they meet where they're actually you know they wouldn't want to fix it you know they're actually at, that helps yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so but, uh, uh is there anything else about sorting you think i missed maybe you guys want to add sorting before we move on <sighs> no, I, think, no. I, I think our biggest takeaway is the government government the government yeah, I just want to say that, okay, we, 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 we left the topic that, like, hey, self-sorting is better. Third-party sorting is worse. Not all the time. You know, I want to be devil's advocate okay. on that, okay? okay. Let's, Sometime. Let's, let's say you're uh, a leader of a team. Let's say you're a leader of a business or a teacher of a classroom. Okay. Um, sometimes self-sorting can be uh, less productive. If you let people self sort with a company, let's say you want to work with all your best friends because you guys are going to giggle and laugh all the time, but maybe your product, yeah. maybe your productivity is lesser than, um, yeah. kids too. They want to okay. have their buds, but if you third party sort with the idea of productivity being the driving factor, not equity and diversity being the factor, I think then third party sorting can be very beneficial, at least productive. Okay. John, that makes sense. This is more of just me curious, general curiosity. Um, do you assign your kids seating or do you kind of like, did you let them what, dude? choose? Assign my kids I'm, seating. I'm asking. <laughs> <This is good. laughs> seating in your class or I don't know, assign like by, by like. Of course not. No. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering. It's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, point that he makes because um, self-sorting can be detrimental. I think um, if the idea is I want to be as successful as possible in this class, let's say it's a, a geology class. Um, you choose the person that knows the most to be your partner. Right. Well, but that's, yeah. but that's inherent in the person that wants to be successful. There's, there's, um, there's a, a, a mindset and a, a paradigm of, I want to be successful at that. this, okay. yeah. but the person that has a paradigm of, I want to have fun. Right. I just kind of want to enjoy my time is going to self sort yeah. themselves a little differently. Yeah, they're not going to look that what, so what 100%. I, exactly. So it, it boils down to the individual as well. Um, so, you know, some people stay in the hood because they like the hood. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I have friends like that, that just will never leave because that's, and, that's what they like to be around. That's the lifestyle they want to be. But, um, and then same thing with, like same, same thing with the third party sorting, yeah. same thing with the yeah, third party dude. sorting. When, when like, like the goal is for the words like equity, diversity, then maybe self sorting. I'm thinking I'm pretty, pretty critical or cynical of the self-sorting if those words are used but if self-sorting is under the premise of what's the reason what's the reason because that yeah no that's that's the idea right like what's the reason why are we unsorting right that's the important part yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah exactly <laughs>
I was asking the science seating thing because I was thinking about when I was in like middle school and I was like trying to find my clique and like my squad, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there was no assigned seating. Then I'd, I'd kind of pick. Well, if the seats weren't already taken, like people that kind of dress the same way with me, or I recognize like brands that look like them. Yeah, like the skater kids. Like that's who I wanted to kind of be around. I'm like, yeah. okay, this guy's wearing some fallens right now. Like, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it with him. He might he might skate. So like, I think we hair. sort in that that way, you know. And that's yeah. normal. It smells like a skunk. And, and, yeah. And like for me, as being like the teacher, <laughs> like the facilitate everything. There's a lot of chaos going on, which I think leads to a lot of like openness to like. To be able to be like fluid with yourself sorting, you know? Um, yeah. Because yeah. like you're like, hey, Mr. Cross is jumping all around. He's talking about anime, but he's talking about working out. He's talking about welding. Like, you know, like he's being fluid and with like who he relates with, you know? So like um I think I yeah. think at that point it makes the kids more comfortable with like jumping over the fence to what would be another group, you know? Because like, like we're yeah. all we're yeah. all part of this thing. <laughs> Right, right. Nice. All right, I'm going to move us forward into the next two chapters. He mentions um, in the world of numbers and the world of words. These are two chapters, uh, really interesting chapters. Uh, and he mentions errors of omission and errors of commission, right, mm -hmm. in, in arguments um, around prevailing social visions. So um, when he talks about lies of omission, to omit something means to leave out um, so in the sense of in an argument, we leave out important information to bolster the strength of our argument. Um, so do you, do you guys have any ideas of like some just easy off the top of lies of omission? Mm, yeah. I'm trying easy. to think of some. Anthony Fauci but... said that the vaccine stops trans. <laughs> it's done. It's done. Uh, That's an easy one. That's a well-known thing nowadays. It's not controversial. It's not three okay. months ago. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Say that. Say what you say. The transmission. The vaccine mm, stops say? the transmission of the virus. Boom, done. That was okay. a lie okay. because he knew it didn't. And so he was bolstering his data, saying it would. You know. Yeah. Jeez. That's True. real. Yeah. So it's not controversial. that would be a lie of of commission, right? That we have data uh, that shows the opposite, but it's a bold faced lie. That would be that would be an commission. error of commission or a lie of commission. Is to uh, isn't it both though or no? No, nah, omission is like no because stating. he we had the data that it doesn't stop transmitting uh, you from transmission, oh, I but see. I say that it is anyway, so it's a bold faced lie. That's a lie of commission. And I wouldn't even call that an error. That is a, like, a bold faced lie, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, um, to, so lie. a lie of omission. Um, I'm trying to think of something super simple, but <laughs> oh uh, man, uh, do I want to step in it? Yeah, dude. the <laughs> the idea <laughs> that Mar uh get the alarm ready all right, all right all right here's a here's one an error of omission marriages have a 50 percent chance of divorce so both sides you never know it could be um is that the statistic it's just 50, 50, yeah 50 percent. it might even be more 50 percent of of, divorce, right? of marriages end in That's divorce sad. It's, that's right? a little sad. It's, but they never mention why. Why? 70% of divorces are initiated oh, by who? Women. Let's refresh and fit shit right now. <laughs> Don DeMarco! Don DeMarco! <laughs> Don DeMarco! But that, you know, there's there's things that are left out of that argument, right? Or um, well, let's bring here's some another Miami one. girls on right now. Let's, yeah, let's, 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 come on. Here's another one. The, the, the wage gap, uh -huh. right? They, there's things that come in that argument that are never discussed, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it would be a lack of lack of productivity during the years of, of child rearing, right? Or it's like, you're going to need to take time so this off. This is empirical evidence, what you're describing. Yeah. This there's what jobs you want to do on average, who works more hours per week. There's things that are in that argument that don't get discussed as much as say, um, you know, if it's a, if it's tested as a hypothesis, instead of a bold faced claim, it's not, it's not treated as like something we should research and provide the, you know, the evidence. Let's go look at data. Um, there's, there's things omitted from the argument. So errors of omission doesn't technically consider it to be uh, non-factual. It's just not stating the whole truth. Yeah, you can say that. It's like, it's like um, the, you got one hand behind your back. You're like, yeah, take that. You know what I mean? It's like you're don't show what's behind your back, but here's, here's what you mm -hmm. get. Yeah, here's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. mm -hmm. that's the, um, 
that's a lie of omission and commission is just being a bold faced lie. So like, I think I heard recently one that, um, dude, this book, it, it makes you go and talk about some interesting, um, very controversial ideas. I heard this one online that, uh, black women are being killed like every fucking 35 seconds or something like that at the hands of domestic violence. And like, it's a straight up lie. Uh, uh-huh. And like people that are believing that they, f- you know, they feel bad. Yeah, it's like, that sounds if this is, shit. and it's like, why is that happening? And and then you think you're like, okay, I accept that as, as truth because my favorite person said that it's like, okay, well go research it because it's a fucking bold face. Lie. We need the, we need the miracle. Evidence. I want to say it, right. go look for the it's harder and harder every day to even do research. Yeah. Why? Cause where you're looking. It's as anyone who's who's been keeping up with the Twitter files, it's showing that broadly speaking, tech is is leans left considerably and will censor information yeah. to align with their ideology. So, like when you go to Google something, like Google has tweaked their algorithms to hide certain articles, maybe that would um, go against their narrative. Uh, mm. GPT currently is like a registered Democrat, pretty much. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that on so many is different it, podcasts. Is it? Did they do the test where it like it, to see what political compass it is or something? Or where, uh, it's a whole thing. But like, pretty one thing is that someone got it to list like what is considered controversial and what's not controversial, and it said like as a whole, the Republican Party was controversial. So, I okay. mean. I mean, is that true? You know, yeah. that's the whole internet. So like, it's so hard to find even information regarding a lot of things to even get an accurate assessment of things. You know, because of, right. of they might omit things. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's like even when we say that, like research things, it's like it's, 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 it's where are you look. Yeah, for it's hard. Like, you know, like, you, you got to go to Brave. You know, like Brave dot com. Fucking, and if you if you pull up anything off of Brave, they're like you're using that. You're like, you know, that's what people say. Yeah. Like, well, dude, fuck it. You tinfoil hat. You tinfoil hat, motherfucker. You're probably on Reddit. It's like, I am, I am on Reddit. Like, fuck you guys. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy that that's the world we're kind of like pushing on right now. Like, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the chat, GPT, Google, like when you go to look things up, it's probably not even true. Like, I'm not saying not true. It's just not giving you the information that you're looking for specifically. For, for example, full. I'll yeah. bring you an example. Uh, me and a coworker were having, uh, not an argument. But disagreement on this is during the Canadian truck rally, and we had disagreement on yeah. how many truck drivers were actually in the truck rally, and her number was yeah. very low, my number was very high. Um, I went to Google it, and I, I had to like dig to find an actual article giving a real number because Google had given me, and I was at I was at my place of work, so I, like I couldn't go into like my normal search browser because it would be blocked. Um, yeah. So. Google blocked that because it was a controversial thing, you know, and they, 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 yeah. they put their finger on the scale to like make it harder for me to find information on it. Yeah. And one yeah. thing that I like when I hear, uh, especially like stories like that, like when we think of articles, like how you said, you're looking for an article to give you the information. I think we forget that people are writing these articles. Like, so we have to, like not saying that you weren't discerning where you're getting your information It's more of like when we do our research behind like say the 36 seconds every yeah, black yeah, one yeah. if we're choosing to listen to an article someone wrote that article and yeah. it's really up to google if they're going to push it to the top or if they're going to push it to the bottom and if you know who's publishing if you if i looked up that article around that person talking about that do i know how this person leans which way do they lean because most people are biased in their writings the way they talk and so yeah. That's it's hard for us to be human. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard for us to be human and not have a bias in oh, here, that is here, human. Here, not, it's hard for us to be a robot. Here's a yes. set yeah. of omission. Um, uh during the peak of the pandemic, they were counting COVID deaths like every day the COVID death counter. Well it yeah. turns yeah, out yeah. that that hospitals were counting any death any death they were pretty much yeah. put it down as COVID because they, uh, because COVID, they were yeah, getting money. It was it's the uh, it's the with or because argument, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Because, okay, an old person would die. They go, oh, turns out they had COVID. Well, they died because they were about to die anyway. Or someone, someone's car crash died, <laughs> but the COVID test came back positive. It's COVID death. Yeah, they had COVID. You know? Mm-hmm. COVID. So, COVID. And that was a sin of omission at the time. 
they have gone back and and said, hey, we might have fudged the numbers, but it just shows that like what is accurate data? You know, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, it really the next chapter goes hand in hand with this really well because um, the biggest takeaway was, you know, you have to understand the frame of the argument, right? Who's mm-hmm. framing it? Why is it framed? Is it treated as something that's questioned or is it treated as something that's um, dogma taken as dogma? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the world of words was a really eye opening chapter that talks about how people use, um, use data either through and, and leave some out or use data that they fabricate in a commissional style yeah. or um, just how they use that data or the lack of it to frame an argument that they're trying to make. Mm-hmm. Right. So I got the perfect one for this on the war, war, war of words. It. Okay. No COVID. I'm not. Okay. So okay. this year, uh, during the Biden administration, it was the first time <laughs> that we had two consecutive negative quarters of growth. Okay. Ah. Up until then, yeah, yeah. that was the definition of this, of a start of a recession. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They redefined what a recession was. So they right. so it, they wouldn't say they had a recession during this presidency. Well, now we've had three quarters of negative growth. So are we in a recession yet or what? But it just shows <laughs> that like, they go, hey, don't use the R word. The R word is the recession. We're not in a recession. We've redefined what a recession yeah, yeah. is. It was the like the war in words, you know? Yeah. Yeah. L- also, yeah. Listeners, viewers, mm-hmm. think about how many words have been changed in the past year, two years. What words? Okay, since the beginning of COVID, how many things were changed? We won't we won't get into it. You know what I mean? We don't need to get into it. Leave it in the comment section down below. What words have been changed? What uh, words? I recently read a book called "The Coddling of the American Mind." Um, the coddling. The coddling of the like American mind. Calling. Oh, the coddling of the American mind by Jonathan Haidt and uh, I forget the other guy's name, but they talk about the term violence. Oh, right? Yeah. Do you remember the? You know, when I think of violence, I think of physical Free violence. Right? Violence. We're talking about is what they're saying nowadays. Now the word violence can mean, you know, speech that we don't like. Yeah. Like, oh, yo, yo. Or if, silence. If you silence were, is violence. If you were playing Xbox 360 during Modern Warfare 2, Dude, oh God, bro, bro. you're violent. You would have been crazy. <laughs> yeah, you would have been in prison for the rest of the Just the life. word violent. <laughs> so the world of words, things are being redefined. People are framing arguments in ways that um, benefit their, you know, bolster the strength of their argument. Look yeah. around and notice that the world of words is ever changing and sometimes it's not for the good. Right. Um, you know, shout out Matt Walsh. I won't, I don't need to go anymore. Yeah. Um, but things are changing around us yeah. and um, people use words in in ways that benefit themselves. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think, you know, the world of numbers, the world of words, both really good chapters. Um, Again, go pick up this book because there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, especially, you know, if you're like a woke woke person, I'm not. Whoa, I can't speak what? for other people. If you're if you're woke, yeah, this do you? Probably... But check out the book. Like honestly, read the book and try to try to break his argument. Try to find holes in it and and put that down below. I'd love to hear about it because there's a lot of really good stuff in here. We would love. It would, I would love to hear that. Yeah, to be dude. I, I mean, we could have a whole episode talking to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so we'll invite you over. We'll do a podcast episode. Yeah, dude. So break his argument, read the book, tell us what you think. Give us some uh, empirical evidence. Yeah, dude. Bring it. Bring or it. Or even like we can even create an episode like if we get enough people to kind of argue like discri- discrimination disparities, we can go over the comment section or whatever people yeah. kind of like can discuss that on a video. But that would be a really interesting read. So I, I, this yeah. book carries a lot. Obviously, we read a lot of books that carry a lot of information. We, I think we've always yeah. said that every book we read. Dude. But if you read this book, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. There's a lot of data. I think this is book. a great book for people that are interested in like, um, it's like policy, academics, yep. and, uh, you know, like S- culture. Yeah, culture. Yeah, for sure. social vision. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. On that note, um, the next chapter is titled Social Visions and Their Human Consequences, mm-hmm. right? Um, so the idea of a prevailing social vision. Um, so we've all heard the term narrative thrown around. Um, there's, narrative. An, there's an idea in culture that is accepted as the truth, right? Um, can we think of any? So, so mm-hmm. ask that one more time. Uh, think of a prevailing social vision that exists in today's culture. The earth is round. 
What? No, no, no. I'm trying to think of some. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, white man is a bad person. Yeah, like, I'll just, I'll just cisgendered right white men are are bad people and, inherently. An easy one was that masks work two years ago. Masks yeah, work. Mask work. That was a narrative. Yeah, that was um, a social vision is wrong. Yeah. So there's, there's ideas of prevailing social visions, right? So there, we look around culture and the culture that surrounds us and there's accepted what we, we could call it dogma, right? These are accepted beliefs in, you know, in society that people believe. And he talks about the consequences of believing those. So that kind of talks, that brings back up public housing again. Um, the idea, the social vision being that um, if all things were equal in terms of um, where you live, you could have a better outcome if things were equal. If a low-income person lives now in a high-income neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, we can expect better results. So there's there's social visions all across culture. Um, I'm trying to think of some more that are really big. Well, culture is a whole social vision. Yeah, it's really hard you know what I mean? Because like, I think we get we get a majority of it because we live in California. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of people that think progressively, which is not bad. I think it's just we just have to tackle things from like um, a standpoint where everybody can get behind and not just choose a specific group to tackle the whole problem by themselves. Um, I think everybody has to be behind the way like states The move. discussion? The discussion, like whatever it yeah. is. Uh, yeah. Are you going to say something, John? Like just some examples of social vision was like during World War One or World War Two, Uncle Sam said, "What can you do for your country?" You know, that was a social yeah, vision. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, Rose the Riveter, you know, like women are now in the in the factories helping out the war effort, right? Those are those were yeah. social visions. Uh, and I think, at the very least, that there were pro-American positive ones. Um, maybe yeah. we were directing the wrong place. We were directing ourselves towards the military-industrial complex. But at least we were pro America yeah. at the time. We didn't hate ourselves. Um, what can you do for your yeah. country? You know? Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, that's true. A, yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know, yeah, it was like, you know, like, the social visions today seem to have gone away from pro America. Yeah. Like, instead of how do we fix this thing, is like, how do we burn this shit to the ground and it's start? More like, it, it's day. more like, who can I blame? Who can I blame for my victimness? You know, who is the oppressor? Who, who is the oppressor of, and why am I the way I am today? It's like overanalyzing what you're uh, potentially a victim of to where that becomes your whole identity. I think yeah, I, I think there's a the part um, by, by standard. Uh, no yeah. hero comes from being like a victim mentality. And like they don't want strong men because strong men fucking ask questions like, why are we doing this? When like start asking critical yeah. questions. That's why they hate people like Jordan Peterson, Eric Weinstein. Yeah. Fucking Russell Brand, Joe Rogan, anybody who asks any critical questions, they're have like the opposite of victim mentality, you know. But like, Canceled. but like, the well, some some heroes may start with a victim mentality, right? Like, take Gara for example. He started, and he was like, "Oh, woe is me! Nobody loves me!" Right? And and something happened, a switch flipped. We're talking about Naruto for people that are watching. Um, a switch flipped. Right, and now he became a hero who embraced that it's his responsibility. Yeah, ultimately, yeah. yeah. Good one. Because, because what what I'm getting at, what I'm poking at, is that I think the end goal, part of the end goal, because it's not the whole. Like we always talk, about, things are very like multi layered. But I think part of the goal yeah. of a social vision of victim mentality is that you don't stand up and change what's wrong by your own sphere of influence. You know, um, like you look to an external source. Yeah, you, you look exactly, exactly Ooh, so, exactly ours. so. You said that better. That's exactly good so, and like if that social vision, if it affects majority of our population, we have a majority of weak people who just follow rules, which is like a prime example of like how everyone handled the pandemic, how everyone handles their job. You know, um, yeah. It's an interesting thought because it's like. If you look at the hero story, like everybody loves Harry Potter, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole thing about Harry Potter is he breaks the rules when it when it's needed. Hey, exactly right. That's why it's such a good book. Like when it right. came to breaking the rules or keeping up to his principles, Harry Potter chose his principles 
And at the end of the day, always yep. got rewarded for it because it was it was the right thing to do. The right thing. Yeah. People nowadays right. are like cucks, bro. Just fucking lend the government. Fuck them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Red, yeah. Hit the, hit the yeah, beep beep. Hit the beep beep. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even have it ready. Huh. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a lot of social visions. Um, and I think one of the biggest social visions that exists today is that Everything should be equal. I think, you know, the right? first thing I think about is like, ec- like the money, wealthy. We should have poverty. an equal distribution of resources. Yeah. Right. Should we should we, have an equal amount across the board to all different. Should people. we aim for equality? Should we aim for equality? Oh, what's equality what's of opportunity. That's what I, yeah. Equality, of not opportunity. equality of okay. outcome. I'm just asking. I'm trying to think of like questions that people would be like. And like you know, thinking of soul, listening to this, you know, soul asks that. He says, if we're gonna have equality, what's the best way to do it? I the wanna, best. The best way. Touch on this equality. I want to touch on this, especially Black History Month. Okay, let's touch on this. Yep. So Booker T. Washington, one of his most famous quotes, and it's on meritocracy. How do we how do we get things more equal? Is I think through meritocracy. Uh, one of his best What's his that? best quotes was meritocracy. Um, yeah. Society or system rewarded on merit. Okay quote was the great human law that in the end recognizes and rewards merit is everlasting and universal and just to give a background of booker t washington give me one second um so booker t washington if you guys don't know uh he's an american citizen he was born in 1856 and died in 1915 uh he's an african-american educator author and leader he was born into slavery in virginia that's why i learned about him in school um, so he was born into slavery, yeah. um, but through his life, he, uh, he worked himself out of slavery, attended the Hampton Institute and received vocational training. He later founded the Tuskegee Institution of Alabama at, uh, side note, at Tuskegee, um, one during World War One, they had the Tusk- Tuskegee, uh, airmen. airmen and at Tuskegee Institute, yeah. they, they invented peanut butter and stuff, um, through, yeah, through right, George right, Washington right. Carter. Anyway, Carver. Thank you, Carver. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, boom, boom. So he's a philosopher, educator, um, and really his big thing was if you want to move up, if you want to move up in the world, you should learn skill and training that no one can take from you, and you should level yeah. up yourself. No one can take that away from you. And uh, right. I mean, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure him, I'm sure he uh, was an influence in, on Thomas Sowell. You know, like. Oh, I'm sure. This guy lived that shit, you know, and he became a pillar in his yeah. community. Started out an all black college where blacks can get education at a time where there wasn't such a thing. And he was like, Hey, if we want to level up, we gotta get merit. We gotta keep earning merit. You know, they can't deny that. You yeah. know? Well, um, if I play devil's advocate, how is it equal if it's a meritocracy? Not everybody's equal at that. I point. don't think it's the. I think the word that we should be using is competitive, instead of equal. Because if well, just, what it, it is equality, but how is it equality? I think because it's equal opportunity. Because like equal opportunity, the position that is open is not given to anybody based on their skin, their background, or their education. Sexual, sexual orientation, orientation or gender identity any of, that. Not based on any of that what it's based on is are you a better candidate are you the best future? and right now our own government like the spokesperson for the for biden uh uh pierre whatever her fucking name is yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Corinne, she, Corinne. she was like she was like don't worry our next person is going to be the most diverse uh, you know blah 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 it's like great glad to know that we had the most diverse cabinet ever in history it's also right. the worst so take that as you will okay we had the most diverse cabinet <laughs> yeah. ever with uh, they even said with an 11 gay assistants okay great 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 this is yeah, the worst yeah. this are is they the good? worst cabinet we've ever job. had take that as you will <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i like to yeah, i like to think going. about it too is like if i am in a life and death situation i don't care what race my doctor is yeah. I don't care what their sexual orientation is. That's the bot. That's actually, I could care less, bro. It could be a, a green dinosaur. 
Are they the best at this procedure? Honestly, when I'm in there, well, is their success rate the highest in the country? An Indian or an Asian man who's on here on, on a visa? <laughs> he's all work. He, if, if, Doesn't even need to speak English. He's, all work, bro. He, he, he's like, look, I, I don't know all about that show. I'm here. I'm here. My work visa. It's all grind. And if I get my doctor, yeah, you can barely... I want the best yeah. of the best. I know that guy. If I'm running an NFL talking. football team, I want the best of the best. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Right. If I'm running a, a country, I want the best of the best, yeah. right? And that's I, the idea of a meritocracy. I, yeah, I think it's like it's well, the best. where, like, I kind of just want to like get away from that word equality. It's like I think we should all like equality shouldn't even be a question. I think like we should be at a point now. We should be like, who's the best? Let's all start at a baseline and how quickly or how competitive or how good are you at what you do? Yeah. That's a competitive nature maybe and right like and, and maybe you should reassess what you're aiming for like did he talked about like okay well not everyone's equal okay well sure you know like if if like high school math is hard for you well then maybe you shouldn't be an accountant okay but logan yeah go, go let poindexter do that shit you know like fi yeah. find yeah. out what you're good at you know like there, there's equal yeah. opportunity out there for you somewhere like there's somewhere there's some field that you can be competitive at right yeah and I think the quality starts at it's it starts at the baseline. Ooh. It doesn't start. Can I read one more quote from Booker T. Like, Washington that's, that actually ties into this perfectly. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Booker T. Washington said this. Um, in business, I think we have all learned in some degree, at least, to disregard the old maximum. Do not get others to do what you can do yourself. But he said, my motto, on the other hand, is, do not do that which others can do as well. So he's saying. Hey, if if nine out of ten people can do the thing, I should be the one person that can do something different. That way, I can yeah. leverage myself better in like this type of society, this type of economy. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's kind of like not preached as much today. I don't know. Obviously, I'm not in the school system or anything. I feel I feel like that's kind of like kind of straight away a little bit like that messaging, like don't try to do what everybody else is doing, but try to stand out a little bit by like, if you are going to be, let's say a fashion designer, go get a skill, go get some skill in like architecture. So you can get it like aesthetic for like, or a feeling for like building design, right? Like what if you don't want to go into like fashion, you want to go into design of like just life in general, like you have more skill and experience than someone that's just fashion designer. Man. It's, it's like you kind of like the, hit yeah. all spheres of life rather than just going directly at one, which is not bad. Like let's not let, let's not say that like one direction is bad. It's just you're just well rounded. You're more better suited for society and more valuable the, to everybody. The skill is very very important, yeah. and um, that's why I love where I work uh, very much. Uh, Bitwise Industries, it's because we we do teach people the skill you know and and there we we do we try and provide the opportunity the best way we can within uh cities that need it and um you know we make it affordable and we we do work with the government in order to make that happen but it is at the end of the day a skill that w people can seize the opportunity and um have a better life i'd say so i have a follow-up question about yeah. equality through merit are we still on that point Did you guys yeah forward? we're okay. still there so yeah. what about what would you guys say to the person that's like well okay i like the idea of equality of merit but we didn't start at the same spot so me and jimmy jimmy has rich parents we we didn't get to start at the same spot so i'm not going to be able to become a person of merit as fast as jimmy that's not fair how do we um, fix that? You can't. Life isn't fair. Okay. That's how I, I don't know. That's how you I slap him in the face. You say life isn't fair. I wouldn't obviously. <laughs> I would like to. I would describe it a little bit better. But like just sitting here to give a simple, an simple answer. I don't think life is fair, right? Like say I wanted to do like I don't know, become a fucking aerospace engineer or something. Yeah. Am I expecting it to be fair to get into a competitive nature, or competitive okay. field where like a bunch of scientists already exist? And I'm expecting everybody to meet me at my level. No. Okay. So I, that's how well, that's my, obviously fair. I would explain it to them. Dude, better, like if it's a child, or I want to tie back in the Booker T. Washington quote one more time for Jay's answer. I think that's it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I was saying the motto is Booker T. Washington's got his own motto. So he's saying, Hey, to disregard the old maxim, do not get others to do what you can do yourself. His motto on the other hand is do not do that, which others can do as well. So 
Okay. Jimmy started up ahead of you. Okay. Maybe you should reassess what you're going for. Maybe you can do something that Jimmy can't do right now, you know, like, and, and, and you can come up your own way, your own lane, you know, and like, maybe yeah. there's a space for you somewhere that you can take. Right. And maybe it's not the main flashy thing that's going on right now, but it's a step in the right direction. You know, um, it's a step in the right direction yeah. with, with less resistance and with more reward. So like, maybe you just have to be more pragmatic with your, with your, uh, um, with your position on life, you know, than, than Jimmy has to be, but it, it doesn't mean that it's a lost cause, you know? Okay. Yeah. Nice. nice. I think, um, what we're like, uh, I want to, if you have an answer to you, but I, I want like, to, I want to hear. Yeah. Say. I think like, th I don't know this. Is, I believe this is why not what we're stating the answers to your question. No, I think the, the opposite end of this, this is why 12th place trophies are, are installed in communities. Participation because, yeah, trophies. participation trophies is to make everybody feel like first place mm. when that should not exist mm. because there should only be one, two, three. That's what it used to be. Yeah, you shouldn't go all the way down to fifty six. Silver, place. bronze. Yeah, wood. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I think the the idea. Um, my response to that would be. You are a product of divine intervention you were given a set of cards in your life right it's your responsibility to make the best play with them mm -hmm. we can't worry about what other people have what kind of cards they have mm -hmm. there is that is outside of our circle of influence that is simply the circle of concern your circle of influence is the cards you've got so take responsibility with those cards and build the best outcome that you can. It is nice. my firm belief that there is nothing in life that cannot be learned. Yeah. I, I agree mm -hmm. with that. People have natural talent in things. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing that cannot be learned. So take responsibility and point. go and learn it. Yeah. And become the best at it. Earn merit and deserve yeah. the job you get. That way there's no questions in the end. Uh, my my initial thought when you ask that question is like I'm thinking of them in terms of like a person right in front of me and I'd be like okay what's your circumstance what's this like what, really get a grasp of like what situation they're in and because I was thinking like that it made me think of a, a quote by um, Stephen Covey um, I hope I'm saying his name right bro <laughs> I think I heard it like recently it's Covey Covey, Covey? yeah Stephen Covey Stephen R Covey um, the quote is, I am not a product of my circumstances. I am a product of my decisions. Mm. So it's kind of like what Jay just said. Um, you know, you are the product of your yeses and your noes in life and where you go from there, despite your circumstance, yeah. which most likely, um, you know, circumstances are temporary. You can change that. And yeah. it's not easy. Uh, that you don't was, have to live where you live. You don't. You don't have to associate with the people that you associate with. And thankfully, yeah. you know, we live in a, in a country where a lot of those things, the decisions that we can make outside of what our circumstances are, some just what they are sometimes is that we can, we have freedom to do so, I yeah. would say, yeah. you know, it'd be a lot harder maybe somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I don't know. I obviously I can go into a lot of detail, but I think the initial America's question awesome. is, I think these answered answers would be said to, to different people at different age or yeah. different time frames, right? Like it would be That's worded true. a little bit differently. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you're a, let's just say an adult, you should be able to comprehend exactly what we're saying. It's like yeah. your decisions are your actions. Your actions are going to be essentially where you end up in life. If you're depending on someone else to get you where you want to go, um, you've already failed. Yep. Um, that's essentially it. Yeah. The idea is interesting too. If somebody's like, um, we need to fix these equalities. Me and Jimmy let start differently. It's like, okay, well, if we're going to fix those equalities, do you live in America? Yes. Then you're in like the top 25% yeah. richest people in the world. Yeah. The most you know what I mean? Country. It's like, isn't that crazy? You also forget that like you have trials and tribulations, but you have to accept and be grateful for certain things too. Like if you're, if you're born here in America, you're in the top 25% of the, the richest people in the world, most <laughs> affluent. It's like, you got to be grateful for if that. If we're going to make it equal across the board, then we got to take from you. 
Yeah, I was going to ask that you question. I didn't know how to ask that. Uh, like I was, I think it was when we were talking about social vision. Um, it's all like it's almost like um, we talk about equality. My first thing goes to wealth versus poverty or poverty poverty people. Um, I, I really want like a social vision advocate, the person that believes what like we're pushing a a, a positive social vision today. I'd want them to answer this question. The wealthy, mm-hmm. the wealthy. Who determines? how much wealth or how much poverty to take or to add from people to create an equal outcome for everybody who determines that do do math math. yeah so like i don't think it's almost like we get to play god on people's energy time effort how hard work because not everybody's in the same ballpark to me, that's there, there's just no world that that kinda, would ever exist. Kind of reminds me of that. What was that? The Constantine. The, Period. The, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> yeah. What was the name of that comedian talking to the Oxford? Constantine State? Yeah. Uh, something. Ca- Castus. 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 Yeah. He was just on Jordan Peterson's podcast. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Really it it kind of reminds me of that. That whole um, like explanation of things. Yeah. Like if we're looking at a global scale, like how do we advance technology to sort of Innovation. do those things? faster than it would take for the, the the playing field to be absolutely completely level yeah and it's not sustainable even at that point you know so yeah. we need we need technology and innovation. yeah i think uh the what's really cool is i recently um heard this idea of this guy was like life's going to be over by the um you know the 1900s we just don't have enough um productability to yeah. feed this many people. And it was like a broad an idea of like forecasting into the future. There's going to be this many people. We can only provide this much food, yeah. but innovation changed all of that. Right. Synthetic fertilizers allowed us to make much more food in um, the same amount of land to feed like, you know, nine, seven times what the population was supposed to be maxed out at. Mm-hmm. So innovation is, um, is the way to, to solve human problems. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Pretty, yeah, that's pretty. So it's like the thing that's going to fix the situation of overpopulation or whatever it's going to be, it's going to be innovation, right? Climate, Elon Musk steps in. I'm going to make an electric car, mm-hmm. right? But until we can get off of gas in any way or fossil fuels in any way, meaning you can go buy that electric vehicle, but there's still fossil fuels powering that car. Yeah. Well, until we can get to f- completely innovate out of that, then it's like we, we, have to go with what we got the best option we have right now yeah we but more there's scientists. there's there's arguments around obviously i don't want to go too far into climate change but i just want to stay like oh, even if we go. go into climate <laughs> change if we even if we'd like How say you, america the so west let's say the west the west completely goes to zero the west. yeah we are still not our zero still doesn't even offset india or China. china's i think america is one percent of the world's yeah. mission and, well let's just say all of the west let's say all of the west uk britain yeah. the united states all I think that's of like five percent it's like not even <laughs> gonna make a dent in the change yeah, dude. jordan peterson makes a great argument he says um how are you gonna tell somebody who's poor not to use fossil fuel when that feeds their family and everything like that because yeah. it's supposed to save a tree like so, i care more about yeah, my family they, than my they, tree they, yeah. these guys yeah. are like india and china and stuff like they're using dirt bikes as like they're every like what you yeah. tell him he can't use that shit no more he can't use stroke yeah, like, you tell me have to go back to a horse like, yeah. you know what i mean go it's like dude we're crazy, so dude. we're so crazy. fucking privileged i'm not with a starbucks on my dirt bike <laughs> yeah dude straight up uh, huh. all right so that's basically all that you know most of it that we thought was really really important to bring up for this episode but we're going to get into our own takeaways from this book so i wanted to open up with the question of what did you learn from this book? We've talked about what Soul presented, but what did you learn? For me, my biggest takeaway oh. was that if we really want to help society, if we want to really bring everyone up, there's two things. One, I learned hmm? I learned JFK's uh, this quote from JFK and he was like a rising tide lifts all the boats. I fucking love that shit. That's been like something that's been in my head a, a lot actually lately. But um, the big thing yeah, yeah. is we should be there should be a lot of positive propaganda on having a nuclear family of having like a mom and dad and a family mm-hmm. that's at home and they work and they educate and they like take sacrifices to help their kids and they invest in their kids. If we as if every American if that was their social vision. By the next generation, we could have a better America. We could have a better world. Um, but instead, 
we propagate uh, like ba- the word baby mama and um, like 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 getting a government assistance for being a single parent and um, like these tax loopholes yeah, and all things in a way to like keep us divided and to not have a family. Um, if we really cared, statistically yeah. mm-hmm. speaking, the empirical data shows that kids from nuclear families just have have a they have more prerequisites boxed off than 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 from single For family success. homes you know and if we cared yeah. as a society we we should we should incentivize those things yeah, yeah. yeah. and when he, when he says nuclear family he means a mom and a dad well put together human beings raising kids together yeah. And, right? and I, um, I think the word well put together, you just get rid of that. Just a mom and a dad trying. I, I think I think that's what you need, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, no, because I think that's fair. I think a lot of people I've talked to, like um, working at Applebee's all the way, like Paxson, even like, and just asking people about like children, like people that are young, that were like 26, 27, having children. Most of the time when we have these conversations, at least all the people I've talked to, obviously this is personal, but most of the people aren't even ready to have children. Mm-hmm. What do you mean, ready? So, you, like, I think how I envision having children is like I have this vision that I'm gonna some at some point in life my brain is gonna click into a ready mode, which I don't think that ever comes. Never, ever. It never comes, and I think John's almost correct that like we need to re- almost remove like well put. Obviously, you need to have like your mental space together. Like, don't be a psychopath. I mean, like, if you're a drug addict, probably shouldn't have a kid. True, right? true, true. Maybe probably. well put <laughs> the baseline to well put together. You should, yeah, you know what I mean. But I think yeah. we set a hard standard on like what a mom and a dad should look like rather than just be the best you can be, mm. right? Like you're yeah. never going to be ready for that moment. Yeah, just because be if, if you're doing you that, your kid's going to soak that up. They're going to be like, my mom and dad were always fucking trying, you yeah. know? Yeah. And that's going to be your grind side. Yeah. 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 I, because, I think, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say my initial reaction to the, to the mom and dad thing is, um, you know, maybe there's times where it's not, I think we, we do live in like a, the modern uh, like society where there could be like two women raising one kid or two men. Um, but I think it matters more of like what soul was talking about, sort of like, like human capital, like education, knowledge, training, skills, experience. Those are the things that are involved with the nuclear family too. So as long as whatever, like Devin said, whatever the family looks like, if those things are in place, I think it does set up the kids for, prerequisite like a lot more prerequisites for success you know Mm -hmm. um and yeah yeah okay so that's a really good one um yeah just um yeah we're gonna say something to the men out there know your value as a dad right (laughs) um and the women know your and there are there are exceptions you know what i mean like we're not saying because you have a single mom you're not going to be successful right um but here's the here's the facts that are that are you can look these up. If prisons are made up. Their inmates, more than not, came from single parent homes. Yeah. Just from the these types of uh, statistics, we can make an inference that it's important to have both parents. Right. So when we're talking about the importance of the nuclear family, um, that's what we mean. So it's it's super important. And um, so big big takeaway from the book. Um, another one was that skewed distributions are a fact of life and expecting equal distribution in life is an impossible fallacy. Um, some of the ones that he mentions in the book are fallacy. No, it's, 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 it's not invincible. It is a, it is a, it is a fallacy. Impossible versus invincible. Impossible. Meaning that it's, um, it's not attainable. Equal distribution on anything is not attainable, not attainable right? Yeah. So he mentions tornadoes, right? If why do ninety percent of the world's tornadoes happen in America. North America, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> there are natural see. disparities in everything that we do, yeah. right? Um, in another one he mentions in the book is that um, a biologist goes to the Amazon and finds more species of ants. Than in the entire British no, Isle, he, he found more right? species of so ant on one tree. One tree, yeah, one tree on one tree than the entire British Isle, right? 
Hmm. Africa has more thunderstorms than Asia and Europe put together, right? There are, there are natural disparities that are just exist in this plane of existence. It's a fact of life. This makes me think of the, uh, the uh, hypnotic rhythm from uh, Outwitting the Devil. Okay. That there's just certain patterns to, to life that, that we experience and realities that are in place. And natural they're laws. set. They're natural laws. Yeah, yeah, set in stone. Just like the right. orbit of the stars, where the tornadoes are. Yeah. Those ants on that tree. Things like that. Yeah, I mean, and it's... it's um, I'm trying to think of the word, but it's to be applauded that you want people to have better situations. You know what I mean? We all do. That's we want way. people yeah. to have better situations. But the fact of life is that... We can't expect equal distributions across the board, right? Yeah. It's a it's the idea of the utopia that shall never exist. It will never exist. So um, the prevailing social vision that everything would be equal if it weren't for discrimination um, is a lie. Straight up. Yeah. It's straight, a straight up, up lie. And, yeah, um, I, I had a, uh, just a thought, like playing, if there was someone asking or just playing devil, devil's advocate, um, like if someone was to say, Oh, well, are, are you just not supposed to care, care for like, say the homeless people outside? Because like, there's no way you can equally distribute you, like say your wealth. Like if someone was making that argument, because you're How saying, many homeless people came from single family well, homes. That's it. And, and, um, the reason how are why, you helping homeless people today? Yeah. So if I was going to mention that to me yeah. is like, well, how are you I helping? Would, yeah. And so mm-hmm. that's mainly it's your decision. I think like that back and forth dialogue, if, it's a great dialogue to have if both people are willing to compromise on like being right and wrong. How do you know that they want to, to change their yeah. life? So you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. It's like we can say let's take care of the homeless, but how many there's, people really want to be taken care of? There's this whole guy. Yeah. Maybe they who like just goes around and uh, interviews homeless people in San Francisco, and they're like, "Why would I ever yeah. want to leave?" They go, "I get three meals a day. Uh, I get money and." And I get, get I can loaded. get loaded with all the people right here. Like it's like a dream world. Yeah, I don't have to work. Yeah, it might not seem like a dream world to me, but to that person it might be. And that's another part of an argument. Uh, a part of the argument as a whole is like sometimes people don't want what you think people want. Yeah, is that argument not being made enough? Well, I mean, let's let's say what did you? What, what? more men are, more men are more men are engineers than women. Mm-hmm. More men work in Silicon Valley than women. Well, we can't leave out the fact of the argument that some women don't want to be engineers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some women don't want to work what in Silicon Jake Valley. Cut throat as hell. Um, she don't yeah. want right? to be saved. Don't save her. Yeah. Don't save her. <laughs> yeah, dude. There's just some people don't want what you <laughs> think is the ideal want for every human yeah. being. Everybody comes from different walks of life. Yeah. That's, uh, that's called being a, a tyrannical tyrant. If you're totalitarian telling, action. You're telling homeless people how to live. Yeah, dude. I mean, some people do like some people want off the street and we should want to, we should help them. But the thing is some people don't and uh, identifying different, uh, those different people is it's hard. JBP, it's hard. You're a tyrant. You're a tyrant. <laughs> tyrannical. <laughs> tyrant. Hey, JBP, if you're seeing this, we love you, bro. Yeah, we, I love we, you. we want to, we would love to have you here. Jeez. I doubt you're watching this, That'd but if you, if thing. you <laughs> could jump on a video call, even, I have so many questions. Hey, so with check made us in two seconds. I, I love it. Check hey, made Here's me. why you're <laughs> listening to me. <laughs> so we got a we got a couple more. What did you learn from this book? Um, if you guys want to mention either of you two, the we have two more there. It is our responsibility to formulate beliefs. Um, I don't know where we were going with that one, but I think Thomas Sowell does a great um, job with giving us an understanding of why creating us any sort of belief is good. Um, he gives us the idea, like the baseline of how your belief can get created, right? Like we're talking about uh, single parent homes, right? What kind of system or belief system will that create, right? What he talks about is it creates a lot of crime infested neighborhoods, kids that are not graduating school. If you create the correct belief system behind the, like that's that's backed by the environment, but that it's backed by like uh, the nuclear family, it's almost inevitable that you're gonna build a stronger belief system within yourself, your family orientation, whatever it is, if you have these things already in place, such as like say a nuclear family, it's because it's it's harder to 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 be negative than it is not to if you have things in life to succeed, right? Like if you have two parent household compared if you just have one single parent, mom, dad, there's a better chance that you'll have someone to be there for you through your achievements, through your downfalls as a child compared to um, if there's someone that's not there. Um, 
but I think uh, the belief system is, is just. I think what that one was really getting to is one, it's your responsibility. One hundred. Okay. To pursue I, that's truth. That's not how I think about it. Truth. Yeah. So, so I'm like, I'm, no, that's because when to, I read that, I was me, like, where, where were we going with that? So, yeah. What's the question one more time? It, no, the it statement just says it is yeah, our responsibility to formulate beliefs. beliefs. To formulate good beliefs, good social visions. So, like, if yeah. if we want any yeah. hope at a good future, like, how can we get there unless we have any concept of what a good future could look like? For example, if you're an inventor of something uh, mechanical or science-related, you have to have a hunch of what is the B that's not currently something yet, right? It's like just out of grasp, but you can almost see it, right? Yeah. You're like connecting the last final dots, mm -hmm. okay? But because they can see the vision of what's not there yet, they work towards it. And then if they're lucky and they do all their proof of work and they fucking do their shit right, they can succeed, right? If all of our social visions yeah. are negative outcomes of like the world's going to explode because of climate change or Russia's going to nuke – us and Russia are going to nuke ourselves to death then those are the only outcomes we can have. But as a person, as a yeah. head of a family, as, as someone at a job, at, 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 at anywhere, if your social vision for yourself is not like, like trying to be good, trying to be better, like if that's not the future that you're actually trying to like carve out, then how are you going to get there? You know? Then what's the future going to be? Things that aren't good, yeah, possibly. Yeah. I think that's where that's where I was going with that when I read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like it's almost like the um, if you were to look at a timeline, how I envision what John was speaking about is almost like you're jumping in uh, the timeline of where like someone has the capability of developing their beliefs for themselves. And like when I started talking about how I thought about the responsibility of formulating belief is almost like what is the foundation that your belief is built on? It's like, principles. do you have, yeah, like not even just principles, but do you have a two parent household? Yeah. Do you have a great education system? Do you have friends that are actually supportive of like, say the things that are productive in society rather than a detriment to your life? Um, that's yeah. Th th that's going to build your belief system. And yeah. then once that's already built, then you get to a point where like, you know the direction. You have people pointing you, pointing you in the right direction, how to mm -hmm. get there, and you have great guidance and influence around you. Yeah. Um, and it, I think that that's how I took it, and it's just interesting how we all took that. But yeah, yeah. I think another really interesting point is how important culture is. Yo, uh, yeah, yeah. It's so important. Yeah. All right. Like, um, <laughs> stepping in it all over. If you, <laughs> if your culture, um thinks crime is cool, right? Like we see, uh, everybody's seen these videos on YouTube, right? Would you rather have the fast money guy they're talking to a girl or a nine to five type of guy? And they're like, I like the scammers, right? <laughs> the yeah, chicks. Yeah. It's like, if your culture values that, like, especially if let's say hot women all value scammers, men are going to be like, oh, okay, I guess that's, that's what I'm doing. That's what the value is. Right? So yeah. it's like where culture is really can define somebody's trajectory in life, mm -hmm. but it's your choice. Culture isn't something that, um, you exist within it's something you choose to yeah. exist and yeah. you and you can help yeah. guide people through culture right you know like um right after reading this book i called my dad and I'm like reminisced and thanked him a lot for things that he had done uh i would say that helped shape me right and like uh here i am yeah. and like i'd like to think i have my own sphere of influence however big it is you know and and that's inside the, inside that sphere of influence. Yeah. I'm team positive. You know, I'm team good future. I'm team we can like we yeah. can have a better tomorrow, a better America. You know, um, we can still love each other. You know, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my it's part of my responsibility. You know, look look at the people around you that you associate with analyze the culture that they've adopted and look to see if it leads to a successful I, I have outcome. I one other thing I want to talk to you guys about later that ties in perfectly with that. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So the next question uh, we want to jump into is how will we apply this book to modern day life? So we've talked about what we learned, um, but how, how valuable is knowledge if it's not applied? So what is the, 
you know, what is your plan of how you will apply this okay. book to modern day For life? For me, this book, how it's applicable to my life is that I think it is ammunition to defend your position against hmm. woke culture. And okay. Uh, I, is there I a lot of that out there? Especially, this is my own personal experience is, is that a lot of times people hide behind a lot of words and a lot of emotionally charged words. Okay. And they, they tend to okay. um, control the conversation through fear, maybe uh, fear of cancellation or huh. whatever through these emotionally charged words. But if you're able to have a non-emotional conversation based on statistics, you are better able mm. to defend yourself in a position that may be controversial. Yeah, you use this almost as like your logos, like your logic to um, to an argument, right? It's like, we can have an emotional yeah. debate, nobody wins in that, right? But if we can come at it with logic, we can actually identify the problem. Treat it we as a scientific maybe question. Have progress, maybe we right. can at least have more understanding. Where before, with an emotionally charged battle, yeah. it typically goes nowhere. But with one where you can, I think, take some weight off the scale on emotion and play some logic in there, I think maybe both parties can move a little bit. Um, closer to each other. And the second thing I pulled away from this book is, yeah. um, never mind, dude. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Dev, you, you really nailed this one. Uh, the top point there. Oh, evaluating your compass? Yeah. How we apply this to modern day life. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I was saying, I, I might re reword it, reword it this time, but I um, think what, I'm going to take away and how you, or how anybody could apply this. And what I believe is what he's essentially is trying to help people do is orient yourself in life with not the correct map, but being able to analyze and evaluate your own compass. So when you look at the map that's created in front of you, the external world, you're able to guide yourself and move in that direction. Like how we were just talking about like a, a child that's growing up based in their beliefs, you can discern right from wrong. Based on your own compass, you get to evaluate and analyze the thing that's guiding you. If you, if you lose or you lack the capability to analyze your own compass, then the external map that's laid out for you will start to make decisions for you. It will start to point you in directions whether you like it or not. Um, what, what comprises your compass? It's, it's, I would say it's fundamentally like only like one or two things. It's principles and your belief system about like what mm -hmm. you think about life, how you think about life. So you're so always in a state of that. emotion towards something on your map with your chosen compass per se, your chosen mm -hmm. principles and what, or even if you have none, you're still going somewhere. Yeah. Even if you don't have principles, you're still yeah. moving in certain, some, some direction because at some point when we were children, our parents were deciding that for us. And so I think okay. John talked about a little bit. At, one, at some point, your parents are – you're going to be a replication of your parents. Yeah. You're actually going to be – if you're a conscious or an unconscious parent, you're teaching your kids how to act out in the social realm of the world. Up until they go to like school. Uh, exactly. They're basically a copy. Then you'll be, and yeah. then you'll be an influence of all the children. You'll be able to pick up things from everywhere. Social. But up until that point, your parents are the ones – teaching you everything right right and i think it's it's really like foundational it's really what are you listening to what sort of things are being told to you and what do you believe okay so by evaluating your compass um frequently you mm -hmm. would say yeah yeah um you have less of a chance of getting lost i think it's <sighs> because you have a, a set of principles and you have a set of beliefs that lead to a productive operation in life. Correct. I think that, that those, those statements, that whole statement is correct. Okay. I think the productiveness or the, the, um, the, the result of being lost, um, is not necessarily a negative thing. Yeah. Um, being lost can also entail going through a hard journey and failing and being able to learn in that process and figuring out why you lost how you got lost. 
if it's the right goal. If it's the right goal. Yeah. I think where it becomes a detriment to people is if that loss was never entailed to have a productive outcome in the first place. Mm. It was just a loss based on you getting lost and losing your side of your compass. Mm. Right. You lost the, you lost sight of your foundational principles. Mm. That's where I become like, that's where I would say it's like an actual loss. Like you were, you were actually lost. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's really based on who you're talking to on like, if we had a kid that was, or not even kid, like someone that we were talking to here and they're like, yeah, just had a breakup, lost my job. Like, back at but zero. yeah, back at zero. But like yesterday I just went to the gym. I'm back at the gym and I'm also building a better relationship with my brother because we fell out when I got hired at this job and I'm also applying for new places. I would say you really like, it seems like you're analyzing your position in life. You're yeah. analyzing where you're at. You got a head on your shoulders. Exactly. Yeah. Compared to someone that's like, fuck, I lost my job. I lost all this shit. Fuck. And they start picking up like drugs. <laughs> yeah. Pick yeah. up like, it's like, shit, you may be lost. You, you might yeah. be lost yeah, yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's, yeah. I think it's, it's not about the map. It's not a, I don't think it's about the map. I think it's, it's literally about your own compass. Okay. I think the map's important though. It, is, it definitely is. Right. Definitely because, is. um, in seven habits of highly effective people, um, Stephen Covey talks about Being uh, kind of your map, map. Yeah. right? It's like, I need to find a way in Chicago, but you have a map of Detroit. It's like, well, you're never going to get to your goal. Yeah. Right. So the map yeah. is important as well. If you have a right set of principles, your compass, right? If you have a right set of principles and a right set of beliefs and you have the right map, you're destined to be successful, right? If your map hits on your journey, all the prerequisites before you get to your goal, you successfully had, a, a, you've had a good map, you've had a good compass and you had a good work ethic, right? Yep. Um, so it's important to take a look at your map, right? Some people were given a map by their parents, right? Oh, you should go to college. You should get, become a lawyer. And you never really wanted to become a lawyer, sure. right? Your map is wrong. Mm -hmm. So update your map. Make sure, um, you know, maybe maybe once a year or so, take some time to just like, you know, really in religion, this is where fasting comes in. Um, you you fast and rethink what you're doing and verify if you're doing things correctly um, based on principles that you've got through either or you've received through religion or your personal experience. Update your map and and verify that it's taking you to the right destination. That's what I would say about updating my map or your map as well. Fuck yeah. yeah. All right. David? Yeah, uh, I want to start out with, uh, I want to finish off with actually the last paragraph of this book. Um, this is what kind of sparked my idea on like how I apply this book to, to my life, right? So um, the last paragraph goes, any serious consideration of the world as it is around us today must tell us that maintaining common decency, much less peace and harmony among living contemporaries and a, is a major challenge, both among nations and within nations. To admit that we can do nothing about what happened among the dead is not to give up the struggle for a better world, but to concentrate our efforts where they have at least some hope of making things better for the living. So the way I took that, that quote and how I'll answer this is that empirical evidence is, uh, you know, kind of like all we have in order to, analyze and move forward and not necessarily, you know, discredit what happened in the past, but to admit that we can't really change where we ended up on the timeline of, you know, life from, you know, the beginning of life to wherever it's going, you know, we all landed somewhere on the, on the timeline and, mm -hmm. um, we, all we have is now. And I think it kind of resonates with even like our, our, tagline is like now equals tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So the work that you put in now will equal who you'll be tomorrow. And, uh, we can at least aim for a better life am among the living. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. fucking, that's fucking yeah. Yeah. He, like, yeah. don't, he don't blame like, um, your past ancestors, decisions for like the life you have now or today. Like, there's not, there's not much we can do about yeah, the fact of the matter happened. is that it happened. World, yeah. you know World I mean? War two happened. Change. You know, there's, yeah, there's so slavery many, happened, slavery, civil war, you know I mean, every war actually up until this point, French second, Indian right war. now and things that are going to happen. 9-11. You know, so it's happened. There's nothing we can do about it. What are you going to do to be it's better happening. tomorrow? What are you going to do? It's happening. What are you going to do? What are you, what are you doing, doing right now? What are you doing? To be better tomorrow. Huh? What are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? What do you mean, man? All right. 
All right, now that we've covered that, what are we going to apply? What did we learn? Let's talk about what was your opinion of the book after reading it? We read this book. What was your This opinion? book was the hardest book. Um, Agreed. And I mean, hardest to read. <laughs> Agreed. Like, just to physically sit down and just sit in one spot mm-hmm. at a coffee shop and get some pages in. <laughs> it, it was a little tough on, on the, uh, the brain power to go over numbers and stuff like that and, and keep just the flow of the text. I mean, some paragraphs were one, just one sentence, but it took up half the page. Like four commas. Uh, But not to say that it wasn't a great book. I think it's, um, it's a little bit of a tougher, just like read. That makes sense. Uh, In layman's terms, it's a read, read. It's a read. It ain't no like passive read. It's a read, read. I thought Jordan Peterson was no, uh, but J- pretty tough. Jordan this this like one was like a romantic <laughs> artist yes. when it comes to literature, you know? So, like, yeah. I'm, I'm, like so it's layered <laughs> in. Up. Fucking Thomas Sowell was like, here's the fucking data. Yeah. No, no lube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here it is, dude. <laughs> no lube. <laughs> no no fast up, wow. JVP has, yeah. like, an intricate dance with the way he talks. Yeah. Like, this He's is thinking. like... A fucking blank wall. Here's facts. Shut yeah. up and listen. JVP's yeah, bringing yeah, the right. loop. Yeah, no, he, 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 <laughs> he's got yeah, a whole. Hey, dude, you're fucking yeah. drinking wine. You're drunk. You're flirting. Yeah, yeah dude. Like, wine and you want to like a night place? Yeah. yeah. I noticed with JVP, <laughs> yeah. it was the best night of your life. Yeah, I noticed with JVP, it was like introduction with idea A, comma, insert thought of like a, uh, like a related idea. Um, but it's and it's it pertains yeah. to this argument in a certain way, comma back we'll to argument you. one, and he'll, then he'll bring like, in a little touch of nature and yeah. uh, you're and, in somebody's and, brain and yeah. in, in uh, JVP's we'll talk books. about a story, a childhood, yeah, and, and then tie it all with a little bow. Um, Thomas Sowell really treats treats this as a scientific argument. It's like right? a you have an observation, you you have a scientific question, you have a hypothesis. Let's run the experiment. Let's gather the data. Let's make inferences and conclusions based on that. He really made a scientific argument with this have you, book. Have you heard? Have you seen his interviews on YouTube? Yeah, some of them. Some, his uh, his tone's kind of like I was imagining his tone yeah. the whole time. In really? This book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will say I. I my comprehension isn't terrible, right? Reading this book, <laughs> reading this Who book, are you calling out, Jay? <laughs> reading this book, I had to read each chapter twice minimum, right? Because yeah. what I would do is I'd read it once. I'd be like, oh man, that's an interesting idea. Highlight, yeah. mark it up, write a general idea. And then I'd go back a second time and better formulate my, um, my ideas about the chapter. The ratio is if Jay reads it twice, I'm reading it at least 16 times. <laughs> the same sentence. Right. And, and so it is a tough read, but man, it wasn't worth it. It really was. I think it was worth it. So, um, no. yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Dev? Um, I just say like, for me, why was it tough, tough read? It's just a lot of data. Like it's hard to like uh, reading this shit. Like <laughs> it shows you like, it's this easy to take novel. like, like we think of, <laughs> we think of like Google, we find, we type something in, we're looking for like an instant answer. Cool. We can digest that and like maybe regurgitate or go teach somebody like, yeah, it's like two lines, two li- yeah. this man, like he gives you a sentence. It's like a fucking paragraph <laughs> with not only one empirical yeah, st- yeah. statistic, but it's like a bunch thrown in there and you have to be able to analyze it and figure well, out like what he's trying he's to do. very like. precise. And yeah. I think that's why it, you know, it's so important that he wrote this book is because it's precise. It's, it is straight to the point and it's almost like a deadpan. Like you don't even know his own bias. Yeah. That's it, really. yeah. That was you know what I mean? I haven't even, yeah. I can't even really pick up what he stands. Like let's, he uh, let's break the fourth wall. Right. And imagine, Ooh. uh, Thomas soul is watching this video right now. What would you want to tell him? She boy, thank you. Doing good thank job, you. boy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thankful that, you know, we have leaders of thought that yeah. can, um, put put a level playing ground for like data and empirical evidence. So still pushing evidence and um, aiming for a better world to even put this information out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for treating these social arguments as a scientific endeavor. Yeah, true. Um, the fact that you treated this as um, scientists treat research really is admirable. So. I want to say thank you so much for that and treating social visions as hypotheses versus right. dogma. Hmm. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for being uh, a thinker. Yeah. yeah. Need more people like that. Yeah. All right. Anything you guys want to ask him, say anything to him. 
No, no. no I, I think no. I, I really appreciate the, I appreciate the history aspect that he gives us the the foundation that um, builds his argument, and then he moves forward off of that foundation mm-hmm. rather than just giving us his foundation rather than starting from the mm-hmm. path. Like yeah. so, I, I, I reverse really engineering. An argument. Yeah, like he's he's yeah. not just giving you like oh this is now like he's giving you like this is where it started, and mm-hmm. he gives you like all the way up until now. Yeah. It was really it was really insightful. Nobody will bad mouth you around me, boy. Boy. Excuse me, I, I shouldn't say that. But Pick nobody will bad mouth you around me because you're you're going to be considered a great to me and, and my generations going forward. So thank yeah. you so much for what you did. And uh, we really appreciate your hard work. The so, social, social justice crusaders should read this book. Read I don't it. want to say warriors. Yeah. And that, that goes perfect that. into our next question is, who would you recommend this book to anyone and who slash why? Yes. Anybody who is... Uh, considering themselves yeah social justice uh, advocate um mm-hmm. we want to we want you to read this book i would i would also go along lines of what you're saying like the scientific literature uh research type um that really finds information in regards to data and statistics to be valuable in their like field i think this is a great way to study on how you should present your information to mm-hmm. somebody like if you're yeah. that great person, example of how you should do it. Yeah. yeah. This is a great yeah. example on how, how you should present your mm-hmm. argument to people. Read wow. a really hard to read book. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. And then no, the only the invested will finish it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I That's would true. recommend this book to 17 to 25 year olds. People that are still trying to understand the world <laughs> around them. <laughs> um, and, and have enough comprehension to, read through this book and understand some of the complex ideas that he brings up. Uh When I say 17 to 25, I mean people that are generally still trying to figure out their way in the world and how they want to conduct themselves. doesn't have to be that number, but um, people that are trying to figure out or verify or test um, the social visions you see around you and the culture that surrounds you, I would, I would recommend this book to you because it'll open your eyes to some things that you may not even hear in your, in your circles. I want to, I want to touch back on like, you know, who, who do I think this book was written for? I really want to encourage like whoever is thinking about, uh, you know, I don't know, policy or or anything with academics or sociology to read this book too. Maybe Mm. in that, that age range that, you know, you're talking about before they go to college or Mm. maybe while they're at college and they're, they're looking to, Become the next Elon Musk. Yeah. I don't know. Sheesh. If you have an open mind, this book's for you. Question it. Yeah. Question so that's it. a half of the world right there. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Anything you say, John? If, if you are a woke moralist, my, I would challenge you to read the book to to like moralist. challenge yourself to read some inverse ideology from yourself, you know? Because uh, like it, it's like one thing yeah. if you're already kind of like – cynical of of data about the government about how the welfare system works and about the words equity and diversity if you're already skeptical about that stuff then like this book kind of already pertains to like your lane of like where you're kind of already going so like maybe you'd be sucked into it anyway but someone who is like on the other side of the fence who thinks things like equity and diversity are at the forefront of the social war um maybe read this book just to see that it's not like you guys are fighting for the wrong things, you know? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Jeff. Wait, are you just seconding, seconding what we said? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like cool. I would recommend it to people that like, um, obviously if you, like if you just like books and you I like, like reading, fucking pick it up. At. Yeah. Pick, pick it up and, <laughs> challenge yourself and read read it but i would Canceled. like a specific recommendation would be to people that are like scientific study filled that are looking to understand how to establish like psychology yeah un- any type of ology understanding ology. how to uh um, um encapsulate an argument yeah. and make a great argument this is a great book cool all right so what did you guys think did you guys like the book did you pick it up yeah, is there like, anything you think we missed? Do you disagree with anything? I want to hear your opinion down in the comment box below. That's my opinion. Thank you so much for tuning in to another installment of Paradigm Podcast. We really appreciate and are grateful for your viewership. Um, and we want to hear from you. So um, we hope you enjoyed the show and learned a thing or two. So before you take off, remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video, drop a comment, follow us on all our social media platforms, and all the information you need will be down in the description box below. And remember, the work you put in now equals who you'll be tomorrow. Tomorrow. Peace.
And bro, I'm a rapper. You heard that? But I'm not a rapper. <laughs> You're a victim. <laughs>